the truth about the Sabbath. What a controversial issue. I mean, you talk to one person and, well, they say on Saturday, you know, Friday night through Saturday, you've got to stop working. You can't check your email. You can't mow your lawn. You can't work lifting a finger in labor because God has ordained the Sabbath day to be kept and to be kept holy. Are we believers under that? Well, to answer that question and to talk about a new spiritual rest that we enjoy today, let's go back and discover the origins of the Sabbath. We find the origin in Genesis chapter 2, and here's what we see. By the seventh day, God completed his work, that is, his work in creation. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. And then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. God took a vacation and he felt great about taking that vacation because the work was over. It was done. There was nothing left to do. Remember that he had saw his work. He had seen it all, and he decided it was good, and it needed no improvement so he could relax. And then, of course, he ordained that Israel keep a Sabbath day in honor of his creation. Uh, We see this in Exodus chapter 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. So the house guest can't do any work, the cattle can't do any work, and you can't do any work. God had ordained this, and we read it in Exodus chapter 20, because the people of Israel were told to observe it and to be diligent in observing that rest. So where does that put us today? Well, you know that today we live under a new covenant. That is, we have a New Testament era that we're a part of. But Jesus was the bridge. Remember, Jesus comes in as this high priest under a new covenant. We've got a better priest, a better priesthood. We've got better promises, and it's on its way in with Jesus. So as Jesus is ministering, there are some Pharisees who have questions for him. Remember what we read in Mark chapter 2. Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. The disciples were hanging out with Jesus and they were picking grain as they walked along. But it was the Sabbath day. And some Pharisees said, well, what's going on with that? How is it that you allow your servants, your disciples, your followers to pick grain on the Sabbath? And Jesus clarifies by saying, look, we're not supposed to fall at the feet of a Sabbath day. The Sabbath was for human benefit. The Sabbath was for rest, but it doesn't mean we're slaves to it. Jesus brought in a new perspective, a new attitude about the Sabbath. And we read something very similar in Luke chapter 13. Here uh, we have a healing that took place on the Sabbath. And Jesus is challenged about that healing. But the Lord answered and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? In other words, you untie your ox, your donkey, your animal. Can't this woman be untied from this bondage she's been in, this bondage to sin? And so she's been healed. And it's a beautiful thing. And healing is an act of love. And it took place on the Sabbath. And Jesus is greater than this Jewish Sabbath the way that the Pharisees had interpreted it. 
So Jesus comes along. He's breaking all the rules. He's turning furniture over in church. He's showing them a new way. He's getting down to the spirit of the Sabbath, that it was made for rest. And that brings us to today, where we have a new covenant, a new covenant rest. It's not about Friday night. It's not about Saturday morning. It is about resting in Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 2 says this about a Sabbath day. It says, says, let nobody act as your judge in regard to uh, food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Those things are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. In other words, these Colossians, they had heard it all. First, they're Gentiles. Paul had preached the gospel to them. They heard about being saved by, by grace through faith. And then people come and infiltrate and try to twist the message and just give it a little tweak. Maybe it's Jesus plus the law. Maybe it's Jesus plus the Sabbath. Maybe it's Jesus plus tithing. Maybe it's Jesus plus anything. And then the enemy loves it because people are off base and the tantalizing distraction of self-made religion has come in to ruin it all. And so Paul warns them, look, if you think it's about Friday, you've missed it. If you think it's about Saturday morning not working in the, in the yard out front, you've missed it. It's about resting in Christ. The substance belongs to Jesus Christ. And so let's keep our eyes fixed on him, not on any particular day of the week. Now this brings us to the landmark passage in the New Testament about the Sabbath. And no, it's not about the law. It's not about Friday or Saturday. It's about a spiritual Sabbath. Remember that we just read in Colossians that there was a shadow and then a reality. So if the Old Testament Sabbath is the shadow, then I would ask you, what does the reality look like? Is it just looking at Jesus and saying his name? No, it's very specific. It's about resting in Jesus. Remember his invitation. Come unto me, all of you that labor, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. You will find rest for your soul. And that's real. And that's the gospel invitation. And that's the spiritual Sabbath that really matters today. So let's enjoy Hebrews chapter 4 for what it is. And as we read it together, this passage, we have to ask, is it something that you and I still need to enter into? Is it something that you and I are still working on? Because I don't know about you, but as I survey the religious landscape, I find all kinds of people saying all kinds of things about you've got to enter his rest. You've got to try to abide. You've got to try to experience this or that. And they're trying to get into the promised land of spiritual experience, so to speak. But I believe what we're going to find today in this passage is that we, as believers, have already entered God's rest. And so now it's just time to realize how good we've really got it. Hebrews chapter 4, it says this, Therefore, let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any of you may seem to have come short of it. So here's a whole body of people, and they're receiving this letter. Some are lost, and some are saved. The author of Hebrews is concerned that some people have fallen short of the gospel. They haven't quite got it yet. They're not yet ready to enter into God's rest and enjoy Jesus. Remember, this is written to Hebrews, and they're still asking questions like, who is the Messiah? Is this really him? Maybe he's supposed to be a military leader. Where is Jesus when it comes to political change? We're still under Roman rule. Why didn't he rescue us from this? So many questions about Jesus and whether he's the Messiah. And these Hebrews, they were teetering on the fence. And so the author says, let us fear. Like, let us take this seriously. Because there's a promise of, of resting in God. And yet some of you, maybe you've come short of it. Maybe you need to hear the gospel again. 
And so he goes on, he says, for indeed we've had good news preached to us just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. So the idea that you still need to rest as a Christian, that you need to enter this rest, that's not what the author of Hebrews is saying. This is evangelistic. He's saying that they've heard the good news, but they haven't united it with faith. They haven't believed the gospel. But if you're a believer, you've believed. If you're a believer, you've entered in. So now your job, my job, is not to try to enter God's rest, but to wake up and realize we're in a promised land. We're in the promised land of Jesus Christ. And yes, there's plenty to observe. There's plenty to learn and grow in. But we are in. We have entered. And so this is very much evangelistic. It goes on to say, For we who have believed enter that rest. Just as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. So what is the writer getting at here? Well, remember Israel, many of them, they did not enter the promised land because of unbelief. That was their disobedience. God had spoken. He said, I'm going to give you the land. It's going to be awesome. You're going to love it. You're going to enter in and celebrate all that I've given you. But they were quivering. They were shaken in their boots. They were unwilling to enter out of fear. And so the author of Hebrews uses that. He's saying, don't you remember your forefathers? Don't you remember great-great-great-grandpa and what happened with him? He failed to enter because of unbelief. Don't be like him. Today, the Lord is speaking. Jesus is Messiah. Believe in him and enter into this spiritual promised land. Now again, if you're a believer, you've done that. You're in. You're in Christ. He goes on, he says, For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works, and again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. So the author of Hebrews is quoting from a couple of places. He's saying, look, God already rested physically, so to speak, on that seventh day. And Israel was already told to rest physically under the law. But what we're talking about today is that there's a spiritual rest. So don't be, don't be like those who fell in the wilderness in disbelief. They would not enter, they wouldn't celebrate, they wouldn't agree with God. They couldn't imagine that God was that good and that good to them. So what's the takeaway for you and me? The gospel is off the charts. God is better than you could possibly imagine. And we're going to talk at the end of this message about what it means that we're in, that we're in this rest, that we're in the promised land. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts." This is without a doubt written to unbelieving Jews, to the Hebrews that were riding that fence. They're not sure about Jesus. And so they could harden their hearts against the gospel or they could receive the gospel and be saved. But you, my friend, have a new heart. You don't have a hardened heart. If you're in Christ, he took out your hard heart, your heart of stone, and he gave you a new heart. So it's high time that we see this passage is not really about chasing after something new. Not if you're a Christian. Not if you're in Christ. If you're a new creation, if you're a child of God, then you are in. In the promised land, in Christ, you have entered God's rest. He continues, for if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Even what Joshua offered them in saying, hey guys, come with me, follow me, let's go in and take the land. 
even what Joshua offered was not this particular rest that God had promised. There was something greater, greater than the promised land, greater than physical rest. It's what we have today. This reminds me of of Hebrews and chapter 11, the heroes of the faith. You know, the author is listing off all of these Old Testament people, and it says, yet they did not receive what was promised because God, well, he, he had something better for us, and we would not be made perfect apart from them and them not made perfect apart from us, that they had to wait for this beautiful announcement of the new covenant through the cross and the resurrection. And we are part of that, living the beautiful celebration of the finished work of Christ today on this planet, right here, right now. We've got something better. It's the real rest. It's the real promised land. And it's permanent. We've entered in, and he'll never let us go. He continues, for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. So let's talk about the gospel. The gospel makes you take that deep sigh of relief. I mean, what's not to like about being totally forgiven? Maybe you have some heinous and shockingly evil sins that you're embarrassed about. You're ashamed of them. Well, you can take that sigh of relief now. You can rest because you're forgiven once for all. Hebrews 10 says you're forgiven for all time, made perfect forever. That makes a person relax or rest. Next, we see in the gospel that you're living under grace. There's no standard to meet. You don't have to rise to the occasion and hit the benchmark and impress God. God's not telling you there's an exact amount of money that you must give or that there's a certain law that you must live up to. You get to live from the heart. You get to be yourself and express Jesus at the same time. That's what living under grace is. And being yourself, being who you really are, that's relaxing. So you can take that sigh of relief and you've entered God's rest. So now just enjoy him. You know, also your old self is gone and you're a new self and you're as close to Christ as you can ever be. You're one spirit with him. So no more treadmill. You can hop off. No more trying to climb up to God. He climbed down to you in the person of Jesus Christ. You don't have to try to get close and stay close or get clean and stay clean. This gospel allows you to take that sigh of relief, realizing where you are. You're in. You're in the promised land. And so you can rest. The gospel is an invitation to rest. And we get to do it every day. And I would argue that our spirit, the very core of our being, we're already at rest now. Jesus promised that rest. I've got psychology. I've got emotions. I have a whole gamut of human experience to enjoy every day. It's a roller coaster, the roller coaster of the soul. But there's a deeper place, your human spirit. And right there, spiritually, we are at rest. And that rest can begin to permeate and affect our psychology, our thoughts, our feelings, our perspectives, our belief systems. Christ has cleaned house and moved in and given us rest and seated us with God. And now, if we realize we're in, we're in the promised land, that can affect the way we do life on the outside. He says, therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. Again, this is written to thousands of people. All of these Hebrews, they'll read it. They'll read it and it'll be read aloud in a public meeting. And what he's saying is, make sure that every one of us has entered this rest because you or you or maybe even you, some of you have not yet truly understood the gospel. And let's make sure that you're not disobeying the gospel, meaning hearing that Jesus is the Christ and yet saying no thank you. Let's go ahead and obey the gospel with the obedience of faith. Obey is not a legalistic word. Here, obey and believe are the same thing. They can disobey and not enter, 
or they can obey and enter. So you see that Israel's problem was their disobedience, which was their unbelief. And likewise, this, this same group of people, at least their descendants, are being told, hey, you've got a choice before you. You can obey and believe, or you can disobey, which is unbelief. Now again, the takeaway for you and me, we're believers. You're actually a believer by nature. You have a believing heart now. You have a new heart, a new spirit, and God's spirit living in you. So you are a believer and you've entered in. So now it's time to look around, to look around the promised land and see what God has done for you. Maybe squeeze the fruit a little, maybe look around at the landscape, maybe go to the highest mountain peak you can find and check out the view. In other words, you're in. So enjoy it. Explore it. The rest that Jesus promised is real, and he has delivered. Hebrews chapter 4 is not an invitation for Christians to beg and plead and hope and wait to finally rest. Forget about the pursuit of trying to rest and realize that you're in. And when you realize that God has set everything up, that he's done it all, you realize that it's called the finished work of Christ because you don't have to finish it. And then you take that sigh of relief. Yes, maybe it does affect your physicality. Your anxiety level lowers. And maybe it does affect your psychology. Your beliefs, they change some. Your mentality about the Christian life, you're not on edge so much. But spiritually, do you see that you are firmly planted? You are rooted and grounded in Christ. He has taken you out of the wilderness and put you in his promised land. He took you out of Adam and put you in Christ. He took you out of the flesh and put you in the spirit. So you're in. And now we get to share this beautiful message with the rest of the world. Many of them are not in. They haven't entered God's rest. And here we get to model what it looks like to be at rest. But you see what the enemy's done. The enemy's lied to us and tried to get us off base, distracted with some sort of doctrinal beliefs that get us filled with anxiety, worry, and fear. We wonder if we're okay. We wonder if we're still forgiven. We wonder if we're right with God. We wonder if we've ruined it, if we've gone too far, if we sinned one too many times, if God is through with us, if we're all washed up. And the enemy loves to feed us these accusations because then we're not observing the promised land. We're not looking around. We're looking at ourselves wondering if we're okay when we can lift our heads and look out at this beautiful land that God has given us. We have taken the land. We're in because of the power of God, because of Jesus, his death and resurrection. We are in forever, locked in, safe and secure, no matter what. So I think it's time for you and me to just take a moment and thank our God for this beautiful rest we enjoy. Father, we thank you for your rest. We recognize there was a day, it was a seventh day, and it was about physical rest, and that was for Israel. But you know, we are so grateful for the reality. As good as the shadow once was, we thank you for the reality of Christ that you have taken us and rescued us from the domain of darkness and placed us in your light, in your rest, in your promised land. We want to take a moment each day and just lift our heads and look around and remember where we are, that we are in Christ and we're in him forever. We are so grateful. In his name we pray. Amen.